Welcome again, friends, to the Seekers of the Eternal podcast. I'm your host, Pale Horse, and in this episode, I had the honor of interviewing our first guest, Robert Ryan. Robert is one of my creative and spiritual heroes, so this was a really fun conversation for me. Firstly, Robert has a highly disciplined spiritual practice, and he's also been honing his skills as a professional tattoo artist for the past 25 years. This unique combination has allowed him to become an incredibly prolific channel for sacred artwork, paintings, powerful tattoos, and transformative kirtan music. In this conversation, we dive into his early roots and explore his latest book titled Deity. And we get to discuss some of the pantheon of Hindu deity paintings, along with his intuitive writing that provides a window into the deeper meaning behind the esoteric symbolism shown in the artwork. He also shares a really killer story about the five-headed manifestation of Lord Hanuman from the Ramayana and the rich symbolism that is lurking within this ancient tale. I had such a blast recording this conversation with Robert, and I know that you're going to dig it as well. So let's quiet the mind, open the heart, and dive into the mysterious, esoteric, and colorful world of Robert Ryan. There's got to be a point in all of our lives when something happens and we become a seeker. So welcome everybody to the Seekers of the Eternal podcast. Today we have a special guest, Robert Ryan, also known by his Indian name, Shivanesh. And it's really a joy for me to get to talk to Robert. And just a little bit of a bio. These are just some things that I've picked up by uh, listening to the podcast he's been on and studying his work for a while. So Robert Ryan is an incredibly pro prolific painter, tattoo artist, author, kirtan musician, and temple builder, and many other <laughs> things. <laughs> Robert has a very distinct style that finds its roots in American traditional tattoo art that is blended beautifully with the Indian street painting style of Calcutta, India, known as Kaligat painting. He's been tattooing for over 25 years professionally, and he's part owner of electric tattoo in Asbury Park, New Jersey, with his partners, Mike Schwaggard and Tom Yak. He's a highly disciplined spiritual practitioner and disciple of Rudra Abhishek. Welcome to the show, Robert. So oh, great wow. to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. And uh, as we were saying a little bit before that, um, it's great that we finally get to have this conversation. Yeah, man. It's, I feel like we've known each other for a long time now. And so finally getting to, to have this conversation is a real blessing for me. How many lifetimes has it taken to have this conversation? <laughs> right. Find our <laughs> way back to each other through yeah. these symbols. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's so many things that I want to talk to you about. I mean, the, I guess we'll start with the way that I found your work. Uh, the first time that I had that I had heard your name before was through Duncan Trussell's podcast. And he was a gateway drug for so many things for me, um, finding it, you know, tuning me into so many different things, opened me up to, you know, finding uh, all the stories of Ram Dass and when he, you know, brought you up and started talking because my, my history is, is also my first studio that I opened in 2006 was uh, with a partner of mine who's a tattoo artist from New Jersey. Uh, he moved here to Florida. I'm in a place called St. Petersburg. So when I quit my job in, in the design world and uh, opened up my own studio, I, I was around a lot of tattoo artists. That's really how I moved away from graphic design into illustration and learned how to draw around tattoo artists and tattooing. Uh, really opened my eyes to sacred art as all the books and all the reference material that all the guys that I was uh, working with and and drawing with you know we would go to Japanese bookstores and look for uh, 
artwork from Japan and from from Asia all over. And so that really introduced me a lot to finding these deities and then, you know, discovering your work as a, as a tattoo artist who was really heavily uh, exploring these concepts was so exciting for me to meet somebody like you. So welcome. And I'd like to, I'd like to, um, I think that to, to get into it is really, I think talking about your origin story as a as a tattooer as some you know a musician uh, how do you find your way back to the spiritual practice what are those things that uh, those maybe prerequisites that opened you up to finding your way back to the spiritual path and what were those sparks for you um well as you had mentioned um the the kind of the music scene was probably my initial contact with anybody that was my age who was leaning towards any kind of inner dialogue or inner change in their life or um, just starting to question the things that um, they had been kind of presented throughout their lives. So you start meeting people that are, uh, you know, just just in that mode of of, um, self-exploration, you know, and uh, kind of operating outside the the usual like um, sports or uh, school, you know, or uh, social activities and things like that. Kind of doing it on your own. Mm-hmm. So through like the the do it yourself punk rock hardcore scene, I met um, some some Hare Krishna devotees who um, definitely brought me to the temple for the first time, um, and then one past that access point then it just opened up you know because um my first experience in front of the deities and the smells of the temple and the the taste of the prashad and the the sounds of the kirtan you know was a you know like i was hooked right then and there um not till you know after about a year in that i started to realize that like what comes along with that is a lot of inner struggle you know and Mm. um So when you start doing these kind of internal investigations and trying to like uh, recognize the the true self within you, you're going to be faced with all the stuff that's been accumulating, you know, and even at a young age, you you still accumulate a lot. And, you know, you can get into past lives, stuff with that, too, and your some scars and your impressions and your imprints, your karmic imprint that you have in as a person, you know, Mm. in this form. But that being said, you know, uh, I struggled, you know, at first it was very sweet, you know, I was, I was, I was, I fell in love with, uh, the Radha Krishna deity. What age were you at that time? I was 17. Okay, so wow. the, the, yeah. the funny thing was I wasn't old enough to spend the night in the temple. So I would go visit on the weekends, but I, oh, I would wow. have to leave, you know, because, um, you know, at the time there was actually even a lawsuit that kind of involved a underage person staying at a, at a Krishna temple. And it was Mm -hmm. like a big thing at that time. So they're being very strict as they should be about children staying there. So, um, but yeah, I was young. I was, I was was young when I got into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You picked up on it really, really, you know, started, picked up where you left off pretty, pretty early. That's, that's really interesting. But Mm -hmm. then there was like a full lull you know, like a a, a good 10 year lull, you know, where, you know, I did start to like explore uh, a lot of more Western esotericism and um, getting into, you know, a lot of the more uh, mystery schools and a lot of Egyptian stuff. And, um, but the, the Sanatana Dharma, the, the, the Dharma that I follow now has, was always there, you know, but I I had to like really, uh, reinvigorate that in my life, you know, and continue to have to do it. Mm, yeah, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. And that for me too, that was really my kind of spark was, was music and getting out of, I, I too, is like, you know, grew up in a safe white neighborhood, all of these kind of things. And, and similarly found myself, um, you know, finding sort of like the the lowest areas to go watch bands and to uh, really just searching and looking and seeking for things that were outside of what I knew and looking for things that uh, 
could, I, I guess it was extremes back then is what I was interested in finding extremes, you know? <laughs> it's so amazing though, because like you said, these, these neighborhoods that were where you were able to have a punk show at that time, because punk shows weren't happening on a big stage ever at that point, mm -hmm. you know, um, that they were such access points to this like amazing world of, you know, like, um, you know, the, the Patalok, the underworld, the netherworld, you know, you mm -hmm. have to like crawl through the netherworlds to get to these like amazing experiences. And that's like all the epics in the uh, Mahabharata, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, there's always, you got to go, you have to get on the battlefield to have the experience, you know, and, <laughs> right. um, you know, that, that that's told Bhagavad Gita and it, it's really, you know, you, you, and your challenge, you know, I was scared to death. Some of the neighborhoods I had to go to as a kid to go see a show, you know, mm -hmm. and the people that I had to hang out with and that, that, that continued well in the tattooing, you know, my first boss was a outlaw biker, a president of the club, you know, and like, it, you know, you, you, and I found so much mercy and grace in those situations. And, you know, beyond, you know, once I got past my fear, you know, I, I really learned a lot about being in those hoods and being amongst mm -hmm. those gangsters and all that shit, you know, like I, th I think that, uh, you know, it, it's humbling. And, and when you humble yourself, then, then you get results and that, mm. that applies to the, to the sadhana, you know? Yeah. That resonates with me really hard as well. Yeah. It, it seems like having a sense of adventurousness is a, is a prerequisite for the spiritual path. And like you said, it's, once you get into it, it is such a battle that Bhagavad Gita, that, that story of the Bhagavad Gita just comes alive so personally for you and having that, uh, that sort of just inner grit and determination to, to keep moving even when it's so hard. And yeah, having, having that kind of a background, I could see how that would really be helpful for a spiritual path where maybe people wouldn't see it that way initially. It's like, it seems like a, a lot of us who find our way here come from uh, finding it through that way, you know, that having, having uh, been around danger <laughs> yeah. and not being afraid in that. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's amazing. That's why the gods all have weapons, and uh, you know, like <laughs> we do, we do battle with our minds, you know, and that and that's really what it boils down to, um, you know, and, and and to the the our biggest enemies are always ourselves. Mm. So to to get past um, a lot of that, you know, you got to put up a, a pretty strong fight yeah <laughs> yeah for you me need, too like uh I you think need some happened... street smarts too right <laughs> yeah 100 <laughs> percent. yeah I, I think what, is, what happened for me too in that in that world of kind of um gritty punk rock heavy metal i was like sort of a heavy metal yeah i'm here from tampa so sort of the death metal capital I was in heavy metal bands and hanging out with a, a lot of grimy metal characters at places like the brass mug and things out here that were kind of meccas yeah. for death metal in florida uh but um but yeah having having that background in that sense i think it 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 opened me up to um an adventurous of not being afraid make me be like for future travels uh yeah. you know i know you go to india a lot and you know having that sort of background i'm sure was very helpful for going into more, more seedy places yeah 100% like the lower east side definitely tempered my the point of this my sword you know like to be able to go through these kind of things you know like yeah having like guns pulled on you definitely like uh you know what will will uh dispel a lot of the ghosts mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and I, th I found in myself you know like having to sort of create almost like these um guardians around me the, like those things that we build up for ourselves to protect ourselves um, as we're young and, you know, going to heavy metal shows um, and building up these sort of um, um, guardian protectors, uh, sort of um, uh, characteristics of our ego. I noticed yeah. that I was kind of creating those like a sort of persona to protect myself. I was a lot, a lot of the time, like more of like the, 
um, I could get out of situations because I was like the funny guy, you know, so <laughs> yeah, everything yeah. was just like, yeah, I would just could turn anything into a joke or if somebody wanted to beat me up, like I could, I could turn you into my friend. That was sort of the, uh, <laughs> the persona that I built up for myself. But I had so many rules back then of like, this is what I'm into. This is what I'm not into. Uh, this is the kind of person I am. These are the kind of people I like to hang out with. And if other than that, I'm not interested. And it wasn't until, uh, psilocybin that those rules all went out the window you know I, I used to consider myself an atheist back then um but then those rules like with the psilocybin I was wondering when plant medicines maybe uh, found their way into your journey and if that helped in in that way as well or in other ways yeah soon after um I kind of lapsed out of uh kind of hanging out at the Krishna temples and chanting my rounds and kind of pursuing that, I fell pretty heavy into the underground drug world in this area. And, um, you know, I, I definitely got turned on to LSD by the time I was like 19, 18 or 19, and then psilocybin soon after that. And, uh, you know, I, I use that stuff pretty regularly. Um, it definitely influenced a lot of my artwork and how I, you know, of course, you know, like it, it made me want to go deeper. But also once I really later on was introduced to ayahuasca and started going to ceremonies and um, working with this medicine, actually working with it in a ceremonial way for sake forsook or all my prior psychedelic experiences were forsaken you know you know mm -hmm. uh times i would wind up at a diner you know uh, high on lsd or like just going to shows on mushrooms and stuff like that you know i i you know there's part of me that it warms my heart to kind of think back at those times with my friends you know tripping our faces off but like mm -hmm. you know once i realized what this stuff was really for and how deep you could go with it and um you know the the benefits that it could have on someone um i really tried to take it a lot more seriously you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah same for me is like um the more and more that you recognize the power of it the more and more it's like okay what am i doing with this how can it really how can i really um, benefit from it. And that it seems like over time, the, in the, the practices and the deities, the more things that start to come into our lives, the more and more we want to learn how to make sure that everything that we're doing is, is, uh, benefiting us the most. So that, that kind of same thing for me, it was like, how do I really start to use this in a, in a way that, um, because I feel like I was just scratching the surface after a while. Yeah. At first, it bl it blows everything open. It's like, wow, a completely new world is available to me yeah. with yeah, this. Yeah. And then it's almost like I get up to it and it's like, well, it's kind of like just putting on, uh, you know, virtual reality glasses and enjoying the trippiness of it and tripping. And then it's like, uh, okay, I know I'm sort of like stopping again at a level. And it was really when... Uh, it was like the things that no longer are, were serving me were starting to fall away. And then I was like, all right, how can I use this in it? And that's same for me, finding, finding really, you know, generational titas from Colombia to work with ayahuasca and, and then realizing the true potential that is, is available with uh, plant medicines. Um, really, yeah, that's a, it's a really opened the doors for me as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's amazing because um, just like my experience at the temple, you know, like like you said, you get blown open, you know, and, and you, you go full in. But then you, you, your your ego takes over and, you know, your um, mediocrity kind of shows up at the door. And then all <laughs> of a sudden you're just like tripping on the weekends with your friends and not getting anything from it, you know? So yeah, once I learned intention and, you know, really like what a huge gift this is from the divine, you know, like they're here, that, that medicine's here for us, you mm -hmm. know? It, and uh what a beautiful what, what beautiful grace we have to be able to to share in that those experiences and you know there's a huge division i i 
I'm, I might be implying how huge it, it is, but there's something that gets discussed a lot in the, the new age world, you know, of like the division between meditators and psychonauts. Mm-hmm. Have you heard about this? You know, people, I know Duncan's talked about it before. A lot of people don't bite when he brings it up um, uh-huh. in some of his interviews with, with like, but um, I think it's really, it's not mutually exclusive at all. And, and I've gotten so much um, from my work with those medicines that, you know, I, I doubt I would, I would have the practice I have now if I mm-hmm. never drank ayahuasca, you know, like it, mm-hmm. it, it was so, so it's been so huge, you know, and to me, it's a direct connection to the divine mother it is her in the form of a plant you Mm -hmm. know as she is in everything but it took me to drink her you know into my body to realize that she is in in all things you know the the the, the, you know i say her the divine mother um she she is in all creation just as you know as creation is itself you know, she's manifest creation. That's what she is. You know, mm. um, a lot of people might be kind of disarmed by by saying that, you know, the goddesses and everything, but she mm-hmm. is. <laughs> yeah, that's why I like bringing that up, you know, because yeah. I, I totally agree with you. It's it. Yeah, I can't deny my own experience. It brought it brought me here. It created the bridge that allowed me to see what was possible and got me interested in meditation when I had no interest in it before. And it just awakened that in me. So I can't deny that. And, you know, on on the path that I'm on now, I'm a disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda on the path of Kriya Yoga, um, practice Kriya Yoga and that lineage. And my, my teachers don't, you know, plant medicine is not a part of the journey there with with that path not not that they you know uh, uh, tell me not to explore that but if you know if you're living on the ashram there it's it's definitely not a part of that path which yeah. i understand like being there when i'm when i'm there at the ashram i'm around my kriya bonds and my teachers there's no bridge needed like i'm there yeah. like i feel yeah, exactly. it <laughs> and then yeah. coming back yeah right so it's like coming back here that bridge can take me back to that place again so yeah i think it's a it's a really interesting conversation and um and finding out how it to, for me too like as i as i got into the path of kriya yoga i i really started questioning like yeah what is plant medicine what's what's its role in my life anymore is it something that i should continue to explore most of the time for me it comes up it's a way to help friends um bridge that gap taking friends to ceremony who really need it being able to hold space with them and letting them explore that and sharing things that I've learned on my journey. That's, that's what it's been a lot of times for me sharing plant medicine with friends. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I understand like there's been many times where I had actually, um, brought psychedelics with me to India and, uh, I never used them when I was there because I didn't, (laughs) I didn't have to, you know, and, um, not, not that I have to when I'm here, but I, I didn't feel called to do it, you know, because there was I was already um, feeling that that presence a lot stronger than I normally had at home. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I don't. It, also, uh, there's something to be said about respecting the tradition. If, if this is the path that you're following, you, you follow that path, and it, plant medicines might not be part of it at, at right now or in the future, you know. So. Mm-hmm. Um, the, just the fact that you, you've had those experiences and they brought you to where you are today is, you know, a testament to them. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. It's almost like when they're no longer serving, they sort of fall away on their own. As yeah. And I've seen them. plenty of people abuse them too, you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah. and, and what, it's funny what you mentioned earlier, I was refer to it as chasing the fireworks, you know, like when you're just like looking for these experiences and it's all external and then you realize like this is a truly internal process, you know, the, the visions and the, all the crazy things that you might be seeing um, are really just kind of more, um, you know, uh, the sum total of the experience that you're having, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And those become, become, um, actually uh, not as wonderful as the inner 
experience. Yes, I'd exactly. love to talk yeah, to you yeah. about that a bit, you know, um, yeah. with being, being one who is, uh, working with, you know, Kirtan music. I I've been listening to some of, you know, some of the recordings that you've made with your band Soma or mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, what I'm working on now. Mm. And, uh, the folks, uh, Culpa who I'm working with in Soma, he uh we had a mishra bhakti kirtan sangha too that we, we recorded a couple records with that two kirtan records of, mm. of those tunes too yeah it's it's beautiful this this combination of the visual artwork with the kirtan music the meditation practice and all the ritual um all of the discipline all of that that goes into putting yourself into a place of i guess like a spiritual adventurousness and a um, we were talking before the call a little bit about this idea, this, this feeling of bhav, of connecting with the spirit. I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. There's like uh, moving away from psychedelics into this place that you can achieve through your dedication, your devotion and your practice and moving that into painting, I think is so exciting and into um, creating music and things that other people can experience with their eyes and their ears. Yeah. A lot of the people that listen to your podcast probably already know what bhavana is, but, uh, some people who might, might be hearing it for the first time, like bhavana is like your attitude and your conduct and your, the energy that you're putting into your practice. What, and that could be for anything, you know, but for, for us, um, practicing sadhana the bhavana is everything because you can go through all these rituals and mantras and things and repeat and repeat 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 wash rinse repeat and um you can get no results you know because if the bhavana isn't correct if you're if you're if if the love in your heart isn't there it's not going to produce any results you know um my my guru gives the example of a parrot you know he's like if you if we want to be parrots we might get some sunflower seeds but that's all you're going to get you know like you can learn these mantras you can parrot these mantras and these scriptures and these ideals and things like that but that's just dog that that's basically just dogma you know what i mean but but when it when it's done with love and when it's done with the the right intent and the right conduct and with the the the, the full determination um, it can it can yield huge results, life changing results, you know, and that, that's uh, that the the bhavana comes through in art, and it comes through in music, and it comes through in your practice, and it comes through in your life, and your relationships, and your businesses, you know, um, and it, like we we were talking earlier about like in music, like the bands that had the proper bhavana, the proper energy, putting the right energy into their music, it always shines. You know, the people that really dedicated um, their lives to their music, it's always going to shine through, and it, sh it shines through in in bhaktis and sadhakas, and it sh shines through in meditators and yogis and everything else too. Mm. Mm hmm. And what about for those say, say are hearing this that are interested, like this is this is um, planting seeds or setting you know sort of sparking an interest in this way of uh, being. What about for those who don't yet have the love or maybe don't even know what love really is beyond the traditional misunderstanding of that word? How do we, is it something that only comes through grace or if we're interested in it, can we just start to repeat things um, oh, yeah. repetitively? How do we get there? Yeah. So the, the grace is in just the interest. If, if you're being drawn to this, there's grace right there. There's something that brought your attention to, to, to this, you know, to this podcast or to hearing a mantra or to chanting a mantra or visiting a temple or what, what have you that there, that's where the grace begins, you know? And then once that spark is, is sparked, it, it's, it's our job to um, keep, keep it going, you know, to keep it flame, keep the flame burning. And by doing that is like one of the most important things is inspiration. So if you're not, 
if, if you're maybe uh, drawn to something and maybe not feeling the love or kind of the, feeling doubts and things like that, look to people that are going to inspire you, you know, mm-hmm. if it, you know, and, and kind of learn about how they came through it. And there's millions and millions of books written about people that are in the same exact position that you might be at that moment too, you know, and for doubt, you know, the doubt is part of it. You're there's always going to be doubt. As long as the mind is in play, there's always going to be doubts, you know, as, as long as there's thoughts in the mix, you will have doubts. Um, they, they occur, you know, they, just don't let them derail you. Mm. And uh, I, I think, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's grace involved but that's out of our hands so if if we're feeling the call um i think it's important that you heed the call always it's something that i've learned in all these kind of experiences i've had that like if if you are if you are being pulled towards it um don't de- don't deny yourself of uh of, of the beauty of the divine it, it it's she or he or they uh, they're showing themselves to you. They're making themselves known to you, you know, and what this is going to do is just open up a channel within yourself that you'll be able to live with the wonder of the world in every, each one of your breath, in every breath, you know, in every moment in every day, you'll be able to experience the joy of, of being a human in this body and in this incarnation. And that doesn't, that that goes without saying like uh, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be pain. There's going to be misery. There's going to be confusion, all those things, but you'll be able to find joy in that with enough training. Mm, Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That is, that is a beautiful way to put it. It's like, don't deny those sparks. Like I love one of the things that stuck out to me hearing Joseph Campbell. um, And he said, follow your bliss. Yeah, a way of <laughs> trying to understand these these um these mystical teachings of India, like Sat Chit Ananda, and realizing that it's this this when when we have these sparks, when we see these things, when we see these like sacred or esoteric images, or we hear these words that um, become this sort of I don't know a dream symbol or something that we're seeing again. That's like a giving this this feeling of bliss yeah like you said it's so important to follow that and you know, rekindle that feeling that you got when you first saw it like i know i remember you were talking about in some of the podcasts um about the first time um you had been given that sticker from the Hare krishna and that, that yeah the jagana and that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the first darshan with with jagana um you know, and just that smile, you know, like every time I see him to this, to this day, I see Jagannath and um, the smile is always reflected, you know, like uh, there's never a time where Jagannath doesn't bring a smile to my face when I, when I see him and just knowing that, like, you know, that was my entry point, you know, that was the the portal, you know, into where I live right now. And, uh, mm. and, and all the experiences I've had um, good, bad and, and everything else, like, uh, walking this path you know I, I was made aware of it through that that smiley face I love that That's <laughs> a, yeah I, and you know like as someone you know as you're making these images and putting them out in front of people that maybe you know in tattooing it's so it's so great the way that you're doing that is I, we can talk about this too is I think is an interesting topic of taking these sacred images and putting them in places that are not traditional, like tattooing uh, in, you know, I, I, I put deities on, uh, you know, band flyers and posters and all of these kind of things. And it doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, somebody will give you a hard time or about it of, Oh, is this a sacred image? Should it be um, in these profane places? And for me, and I and I and I know from hearing you talk about it as well. I just, I, but I think it's good to talk about it. Um, is I love creating these images and putting them in front of people who um, may get that same spark that we got when we saw it. You know, these yeah. these images led me out of my um, 
atheism. I, and it worked, they worked on me for years and years and years before I actually, you know, seeing Hanuman in the temple, you know, over 18 years ago, that it just worked on me and worked on me over the years until I finally got so curious that I read the Ramayana, you know, it just, you never know the impact that um, putting these sacred symbols out. Would you um, mind talking about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Tattooing to me had always underneath this seemingly gross belly underworld of tattooing that was always there with like bikers and partying and just chaos and the tattoo shops and stuff like that. It was a sacred practice. And um, the, I, the understanding of the lineages through tattooing is really important, even, you know, amongst the, the most kind of base uh, ignorant tattooers, they still know about their, their lineage which, you know, uh, was, is super important. You know, we bow to our guru, we bow to our guru's guru, our guru's guru's guru, you know, um, we do, you know, that was, that happens in tattooing too. And the fact that you're inscribing an image on another person's body, for semi permanently, you know, per, to, it will last, it will outlast the body, you know, or the, the soul animating that body. Um, it, it, it's a sacred craft. And then you, go, you get into indigenous tattooing and things like that. And then you realize like that it was uh, super ritualistic. Um, you know, there, there's pain involved. There's like, you're crossing all kinds of thresholds and things when you're getting a tattoo. Um, so, and just the, just the charge you feel from getting a tattoo like that, um then endorphin rush and the excitement and things like that like that's a, it's a, it's an experience you're having mm. an experience you know and every experience is a spiritual experience if you believe in god mm. you know what i mean mm-hmm. so yeah um and if you and if you have love for god in your heart you know you'll be able to resonate with all these things and uh yeah i, I guess you know uh, it, it's important i think about like the, the impact that the Nasringa Dave, the Narashima um, painting on the cover of the Chromex Best Wishes album. I've 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 had the privilege and the joy of meeting the woman, uh, Mother Jagarani, um, who painted that. She was at the temple in Brooklyn when I was visiting there, and she painted that in the full bhavana of Krishna. You know, like her love for Krishna is so great, and then it wound up. You know, she allowed the Chromex to use it. You know, and um, I, you know, I still see it on kids shirts and like it, it still has that impact, man. It's such a strong image and it's saying so much, you know, and like if that brought one person closer to the divine or one person closer to the realization of the self mission accomplished for her mm-hmm. and what a huge blessing to be able to provide that to someone. And I, I think it probably it probably it changed so many people's lives just in one painting you know that painting is so like it, i've seen it in all over the world her version of it you know and it, it, it it's a it's a powerful image it's been it's a powerful story and um her her presentation of it is is uh, at the top you know like mm-hmm. the, the highest um mm. so yeah like it wound up in a, in a kind of, you know, a band with some scrupulous characters involved and, you know, um, all kinds of drama that surrounded that, that scene and that band and things like that. But like, man, just that, that the power of that album cover alone is That's huge. That's cool. That's a great yeah. example. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's almost like, I like to think about it as these gods and goddesses are coming through it's it's not even you know they they're showing themselves they're coming back into this era that we're in these um showing themselves through our music even if people in, in that band didn't quite understand what what that image was it's coming through and i like to even with with me and making artwork you know it's like as these things started becoming interesting to me i i got to a, a before i was comfortable um 
putting them into my work, just studying them and, um, you know, practicing drawing them. And then eventually um, being comfortable enough, having a, enough of an understanding to start putting them into my work. And then it, it feels so much more and more that these, these gods are uh, generate, you know, becoming generative into this realm through us, uh, through whatever background that we have, whatever got us interested in it. And now being able to put them in front of others to experience, because I feel like the power is there, even if you don't quite understand all the symbolism, you even if you just see Sanskrit, you know, you there, you can feel that ancient power, you see these images, and you don't know all of the we don't have the in a, here in the West, we don't know all of the, the symbols and the meaning right away. But I feel like they carry that that power no matter what. So it's, yeah, I love you know seeing the things that you've done with it to introduce um, more and more people to it. And I'd like to get into talking about your book because um, the Robert Ryan's book Deity. Um, you've you've uh, published few books now. Yeah, that that um, was my second of of just you know my work, and then it, there was a smaller collection through the Black Dagger series. So I have three that are available right now. Mm. And this, I think, is is such a, a great book because uh, if you're looking to explore the symbolism of, of these deities and you want to have like a pantheon along with really i i love the writing in this book i was i thought it was just going to be a book of images you know and then when i got this and i saw all the writing that you had done in it i was just like wow this is a gem and i've just kind of been slowly going through it um taking in one at a time with this um and i'm just i was just really floored by how beautiful the writing is and i know i wanted to know maybe about how does that wisdom come up in order to write about these deities? Does that come up, you know, say as you're spending time uh, painting them, do ideas and, and how do you capture those wisdom when they come up? Well, you know, uh, I was going to say b before you even brought it up, um, the, the experience that you or I have with being uh, privileged enough to paint these deities, we're having a, a, a whole other experience, you know, not, not the viewer, but the, the ones that are kind of like, I hate to say creating them because they're already created, you know, um, but like, um, I guess, uh, hosting them, you know, or, uh, bringing them, uh, pu putting them into uh, view. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, it, it, spending 15 to 20 hours painting these things you know I, a lot of the times i'll do them in one shot so it'll be like a 12 hour stretch of painting um it's definitely like a a deep deep meditation you know and a, a deep um dive into the, what what you're doing you know and um ha, you know having the grace of a, an amazing teacher to help explain a lot of this stuff to me and just uh doing my own homework on a lot of it uh is how i was able to to expand on a lot of it but a lot of this stuff came from self-inquiry as as i'm painting i'm like why is ganesh holding the axe and the noose behind you you know and like what amazing um symbolism that is you know it's like uh and, and i mean ganesh is actually one of my favorites uh as far as it's like just so steeped in symbols you know, like just every, everywhere, everything about him is a symbol. And I, I love that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it, it, it's a, a really beautiful, intuitive way of sharing uh, what, what these, what these amazing um, gods and goddesses represent in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ganesh was a, was a entryway for me as well into the into this world the first time I was really started chanting mantras it was with Ganesha I actually came to finding the the power of the deities by first um taking some courses from Jason Louvre uh oh yeah yeah you know on chaos magic yeah he's amazing 
Yeah. And that, you know, it was like, I, I became interested in chaos magic and, and then it was, he was teaching us how to create sigils and to create an intention and to work with a deity and to, you know, light candles and to create a, an ambiance around that. And first time I did that, I was like, Whoa, this is for me. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then so it was cool. like, yeah, just move this into Sanatana Dharma. It, it it just um yeah it opened that up um and i was wondering you know like maybe just to hear because i think there's a lot of um maybe um misunderstanding around deities as uh, what they what they are i was wondering if maybe you could give your uh description of how what you see as a deity your understanding or or what it represents for me, the deity is a perfect reflection of who we are. You know, it, it's our higher selves established in the forms of gods and goddesses um, or uh, like the Shiva Lingam, which is the main deity that I worship. Um, there's it's uh, unmanifested consciousness, you know, um, but it. it each deity has its own expression of consciousness and how that consciousness relates to the person who's viewing the deity. And just like any, any piece of art or any painting or any uh, song that we hear, it's, it's the person's own personal experience with the deity, which makes the bond between that person and the deity. You know, it's like, you can't really tell someone how to to look at a, at a statue, you know, or how to look at a painting. You can point out the meanings, you can point out, but what truly resonates with that the person who's viewing a deity is their connection to it, you know, and what what it does for them. And when when a deity is properly installed with the prana pratishta, when the life force is put into it, and then it's properly maintained, you know, uh, worshipped, and they, it, it builds um, what what is called chaitanya, which is energy. It build it, it and it holds the energy, and that's why, like a lot of the pace that you use in the worship of deities and the abhishek's and things like that are are meant to hold the energy into the deity, you know, and the certain flowers that you use, and you're bathing it with milk and water and things like that, and you're offering flames, so you're cleaning them, you know. There's like all these th all these processes of um, maintaining a deity are to keep the life force flowing and make it um, uh, accessible to anyone who's going to see them. Mm -hmm. It's almost like that energy that you're putting into it, you get back. From, yes, it, it reflects it. back at you, you know, mm -hmm. and and all the all the your thoughts, your expressions, your energies, your intentions, all those things. Uh, will be reflected back to you um, because and by like our meditation on the deities we're opening ourselves up subtly or you know opening ourselves up to those subtle energies you know if you if you sit in front of a deity and you're distracted and you're thinking about all these other things it's not going to have the same effect but if you sit there still breathe focused on your breath focusing on the deity back and forth you know eventually you know, you'll, things will, you'll get into a, a psychic connection or a, some sort of uh, rhythmic connection with the deity and um, amazing things can start to happen. You'll, you'll have amazing experiences in front of them. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And thinking about your description of it being a reflection of the self, it makes me think of uh, that word, the self. And the self, as we know from spiritual practice, the more we, we dive into what is the self, and the self is really all that is, all that is, is the self, this reflection of the, uh, the, the forces of nature, almost like these images, they are just representations of what actually is here in a way for our human minds to be able to have a relationship with what's here you know like i think maybe people oftentimes get confused and think we're worshiping something separate from nature which yeah, it's is this external yeah. thing you know like uh, mm -hmm. you know and, and unfortunately 
that belief comes from the Judeo-Christian belief that there's a God in the sky. You know, when it was when it was the Master Christ who taught us that the kingdom of heaven is within us. Mm-hmm. You know, and like it's not this external process, and it's not like you know, like uh, it. What activates the deity is your view of the deity. Because if you if you get before a Shiva Lingam and you don't, I mean, you're not feeling anything towards it. You're not even trying to. It's just a stone. You know, what are, what are these silly people doing worshiping this stone? You know, but when you understand the concept of um, innate uh, consciousness with active consciousness, which forms all creation, and that's what you're viewing, and that's what you're seeing yourself in that uh, consciousness of all creation, um, then amazing things can start to occur to you, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and it could change your view and it can it can kill like all the self-loathing. It can kill all the uh, victimization that you hold, you know, all the, all the thing all the things that you don't feel good about yourself can be erased through the focus of, you know, the consciousness and creation. Mm, that's true, man. And when that comes, man, what a gift it, 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 to really feel that, you know, and we get glimpses mm-hmm. of it, you know, easier mm-hmm. said than done because it comes right. right back. But, you know, that's what <laughs> that's what this training is for, you know? Yeah. To be I happy. wanted to use a, an example from from your book here, a lesser known sure. deity that I think is a really cool uh, or a really uh, maybe a um, a great example of it's like an esoteric image that's a symbol and this is maybe you can help me with the pronunciation here Dumvati. yeah Dumvati, yeah Dumvati. uh yeah so she's the she's smoke uh doom it, you know is is the color of smoke and uh she's a, a widow so you know there's 10 mystery goddesses and she's one of them and each one has a different aspect of, of a woman's life and she's the widow goddess, you know, which I love that in our Dharma that even the widows are worshipped, you know, and mm. she's in a she's on a cart that's not being pulled by anything. So she she's um she's representing that that space and time of non movement, you know, not going e- either direction, you know, mm. and she, and she's like a hag, you know, like she's 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 withered. She's not beautiful, but she's She's got the patent, you know, it's a very powerful um, aspect of our lives, you know, that, you know, she's got a basket. That basket is, she, it's a winnowing basket with a broom. Those, that's, those, that's her iconography. You know, all these gods have these great like swords and axes and these Vajras and, uh, you know, all these amazing like weapons. And she has a basket with a broom, you know, and she's, <laughs> right. she's sweeping up our karma, you know, and, um, so when you med- when you meditate on her aspect or you do these kind of pujas to the aspect of her, you're tapping into that area of of our existence, you know, which is uh, again also divine, you know, where a lot of people look at a widow and they just see misery and things like that, but that's not necessarily true. Mm-hmm. I think the f- yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's like for for people like or us people watching this people interested in tattoos and artwork and so often we get drawn to these images that you can tell are just so rich with symbolism even if you don't know what it is you're just like what is that I need to know about it and just looking at this image you know with the flag with the crow on it and these strange yeah. symbols they just make you like I need to know more about it and so having a but- book like this allows you to know more about it that's what tattoo flash always did to me. Like I'd go in a tattoo shop and from a young age be like, what is that? You know, what, what does that mean? You know? And it's like this, you know, it was usually uh, themes of life, death, love, loss, all this stuff. But like pictorially they, they'd be these amazing. And then you start to see the Japanese stuff and, you know, stuff from different areas of the world. And it was always just like this in- intense symbolism and, you know, with like Doom, Doom Vadi, like that is funny you picked that one out because that was the scariest painting I ever made. You know, mm. like I was I was in fear making that painting and I, I normally don't ever say 
give too much uh, background on what what goes on when I'm painting it. But that mm-hmm. specific painting <laughs> scared the shit out of me when I painted wow. her, you know, because her her face, you know, like mm-hmm. her, her 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 scowl is it, there has to be beauty in the scowl, you know. So it was like, it, and she's emaciated, and I was like, uh, it was I was really trying to honor her in a beautiful way and still get across, you know, how how uh, frightening of an aspect she can be. Mm, uh, yeah, I can see what you would mean by by that feeling, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. like even when I'm working on images right now, I'm working on a series of Hanuman. And even sometimes when I'm just, you know, drawing, sketching, working on the details of it, this, the, the, the immense ancient power of that symbol, it just overwhelms me sometimes. And I need to just stop and pray to it and, and, and bow to it and, you know, ask it just to come through me in the right way. So I can imagine in Hanuman is a power is like a courage and a power, you know, it's supposed to help you yeah, on yeah. Your mission. with this one. It's like, okay, you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're tuning into this and it needs to come through properly to not kill you. <laughs> yeah. And it also it's like, yeah, you need to clean up your act, you know, like she's got the broom and the, you know, yeah. the, the, the waste pan, you know, it's like, yeah, it, it, it definitely I think that when that those kind of feelings and those emotions come up when when you're creating these things, um, that means they're working, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to take it, yeah, right, to just uh, allow it to to be there and to to be humbled by it, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's see. Um, another. So yeah. So I highly recommend everybody to get this book. It's still available, right, on Reiki. Oh Line. yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. Though. They'll, I'll try to make them available as long as I can. Um, Good. Yeah, yeah. This is one that just needs to be around. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was a, that, th- this was one of the most powerful experiences I've had, like making art was making this book. And a lot of it is because I, I did it during the pandemic, you know, and it came the whole timing of the pandemic. The book was started before it happened, but the fact that I had like months alone at home, you know, um, not having to go out in the world was really beneficial for the making of the book, but also mm-hmm. like all of the things that were happening um, to us as a society, as I was making it, it was just like, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better project to be working on, you know, really helped me get through it as yeah. well, you know? Yeah. I wanted to say too, like your Instagram during the lockdown periods there was super comforting to me to see you making a painting every day like that. Like, yeah and and, and that people so good people seeing it and and being like excited and uh you know i sold a few of them but i was i was mostly making them for this and uh but i you know like when the when that shit hit and i, I just knew like it, i didn't want to fall into all the chaos that was happening and i was like i'm just gonna try to not spread fear and just try to spread like as much love as I can to, mm-hmm. you know, in my own weird way on a telephone, you know, through mm-hmm. these pictures. And um, yeah, I, I, I just saw so many people trying to spread fear and division and hatred. And it was just like the, the sickness manifesting in people that didn't even have it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But it's just like we were just as sick as we could be as a society at that time. And uh, I was trying to do everything I could to, for me not to go down the toilet with it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, good work. It, it was, Thanks. it was, it was very, yeah. um, there was only like a few people like, you know, I wanted to tune into during that time, like, cause what you said, I mean, and it's no fault of anybody. I totally understand. Like it's just that during that time, it was just who knows what's happening and there's, but for those of us who have had a spiritual practice, who were able during that time to stay calm and to um, alchemize all of this tension into art and smiles and continuing to just spread. It's going to be okay. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's such a gift. I think whenever it's like pressure makes diamonds, I like to talk it, about it a lot of whenever yeah. things are difficult, the art gets better, you know? Always. Yeah. 
I love I love the word alchemize. That's great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, man. So thank you for doing that, and I, I really appreciate this book, and and also do to be able to go through this and to be able like if I have a question on a deity or I can read about it and then work on it, and just like you said, as the more I put energy meditating on a deity and creating artwork around it the insights the personal insights that come like i can read about the symbolism that you've put into here and then those insights about how i can use it in my own life or how this deity is going to come in and clean up my own stuff it just uh, it comes alive so yeah i recommend people getting into this if you're slightly interested in in deities thank you so much Mm -hmm. um so yeah some of the other things i wanted to talk to you about um i mean your your main focus i think is is around shiva um you consider yourself a is it, what, what would the term be the sh- well, devotee of shiva shiva, shiva bhakti shiva um uh but you know like with that i'm it's shiva shakti you know like because with with shiva without the without the divine mother without the shakti the shiva's inert consciousness you know that she's what manifest what would uh manifests and creates the beauty that is shiva you know she she's she's what like charges him and 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 keeps him uh in my heart so yeah it's shiva shakti worship you know Mm. yeah it was that um Shiva came to me so strongly um, as I became interested in these things after moving through Ganesha, becoming my becoming friends with Ganesha and learning about his dad. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And learning about Shiva being this reluctant family man or reluctant in to participate in the world at all. Like I was I had such a kinship with that feeling of you know, so often I just want to be the Shiva sitting in the forest with the creepers and everything growing up around me. And I just want to give it all up, but keeps getting pulled back into the world through Shakti. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. resonated so well with me. They're always pulling them back in. Even the gods do too. Brahma and Vishnu are always, you know, they, they always go to Shiva when, when, uh, you know the 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 firm determination the the inner peace the silence of shiva you know they turn to him when when the shit really hits the fan you know like when they made the uh you know the the amrit the nectar you know uh when the poison w- was created who swallows it but shiva you know the only one that could you know mm. or when when there's a uh, uh, Shiva, you know, never wanted to have children. He was a celibate, you know. But then, like, when the demon gets born that is going to destroy the world, Shiva has to have a kid, <laughs> like mm-hmm. things like that, you know. Um, so yeah, it, and it, it, I think it's a good, also that it's good that because Shiva's that's that's how uh, they express compassion, you know, how the Rishis. Uh, express the compassion and the lovingness of, of the consciousness of infinite goodness that he would come out of meditation. He would come out of that inner, inner peace to, to do the work here for us, you know, mm-hmm. you know, so, so because he's the Lord of the multitude, you know, he, he, the gun, the Ganas who are the multitudes follow him. And that's why Ganesh is going you know, he's, he's the head of them, but uh, yeah, the, the, he's the people's God you know mm-hmm. that's that and that's why i love shiva you know he's like you know all the gods are like or, ornate and jewelry and shiva's got just some seeds around his neck naked uh, covered in ash you know and he's his like friends are demons you know yeah, that yeah. resonate so hard we got so many that's demon us. friends <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> yeah. it we're we're the goblins and ghosts you know mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah in, in in the in the realm of the divine yeah and and always you get to see shiva learning and growing which i think is really interesting to think about with a god and he makes mistakes yeah you know, like cutting off ganesha's head wasn't necessarily the best <laughs> thing you know and he was getting a, a rash of shit for, for it from uh, yeah uh from parvati you know so you know he made right and made ganesh but yeah like you know he, he's always uh, off with the head right right away and um I, there's something to be said about that you know he, he's action you know it's, 
you know, mess around in, in the face of nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this, uh, another question I had for you, I know, um, so I, I'm a fan of um, uh, your wife's work as well, mm -hmm. MM, MM Textiles. Yeah. Um, you got, you're married, right? Yes. You're yeah. married. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, it, does she share in your spiritual practice or how does the dynamic look there? I think it's, it's cool for people with the, hear about sort of householders and the, the yeah, different dynamics. Yeah. The Grihasta is, you know, that's one of the, the ashramas that you, you go through in, in life, you know, like um, there's um, uh, Brahmachari when you're a celibate student, then you're a Grihasta householder, then you become a sannyasi when you give up everything. And uh, it's the, the last nyasa, you know, the last uh, um uh, well, with establishment in your life is that you go, you know, you, you take your spiritual practices inward. So um, in the Grihasta in the householder relationship, yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting because she has her own thing. She practices, um, she meditates using the TM method and that's what she does. And our, our practices are totally separate. Um, she has a lot of the same interests, but she has a completely different life and she's not like, at all really concerned with like deity worship and things like that you know she's more into like um more of the yana yoga approach where like mm -hmm. of just like um you know quieting the mind and meditating and working on her focus and things like that mm -hmm. she does a lot more you know a lot of her her practice is like more physical fitness too mm -hmm. um uh but yeah, you know, we share in a lot of the same interests, but maybe not in a lot of the same beliefs. And um, I, I respect that, you know, as, and then there's a balance there of like, you know, um, I think if we were both kind of trying to crash the gates at the same time, it might not, <laughs> we'd probably burn out, you know, and uh, I've seen that happen with a lot of people. And actually, the, 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 when I, um, when I was young and I was trying to uh, really follow the path of bhakti yoga, um, I met a woman and I thought she was into it too. And we thought we'd be able to practice it together. And like within a, a month, we both had completely dropped out and weren't doing any kind of practice and mm -hmm. we're doing like relation, you know, teenage relationship stuff. But like, um, I think it, I, I think it's good to have a balance and I don't think you, you're, your lover and your wife or your husband or your significant others need to, to have the same practice as you, you know, as long as they respect that you have a practice and you respect that they have a practice. Um, I, I think a lot more can probably get done that way. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And you're balancing each other and teaching each other things uh, and having that. Uh, oh yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting taught all the time. Trust yeah. Me. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah but her, mm -hmm. her work is incredible too. You know, I'm, I, 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 hey, you brought it up. I have to, I have to, uh, it's chill. on my bucket <laughs> list as an artist to, to, yeah. to collaborate with her on a banner at some point here. So I definitely yeah. want to do that with, yeah. Create something with her. And like seeing her focus in her art and in her craft and in her her determination to perfect what she's doing is super super inspiring you know mm -hmm. like i'm a mess in my my approach compared <laughs> to how she does things so yeah you it, could it, tell her craft is just yeah. precise yeah uh -huh. and yeah, so check out her work mm textiles on instagram yeah um, and i've been like um i've been like you know it, it seeing that it's reflective in my sadhana practice too like you know keeping the temple clean or uh, just like increasing my focus and not and uh, and uh, you know kind of like striving to, and through the determination she she's inspired me in this practice as well Beautiful. Man, there's so many things to talk to you about. God, like going into <laughs> it's like we haven't even talked about the tent. We're gonna have to do these do, do these uh, again. Uh, yeah, do a I'll series do a of these. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, just to I wanted to um think to uh something that I wanted to ask. I always love hearing you tell stories from scripture. And with the project that I'm currently working on with Seekers of the Eternal and building a community, we're working on a, a web three community and spreading this 
message of Hanuman in new ways, similar to like tattooing, taking taking this uh, spirit of Hanuman and moving him into the world of, of Web3 for a new uh, uh, way to express himself in this world. Um, and I love hearing stories about Hanuman. I love telling stories about Hanuman. I was wondering if you could tell us a story about Hanuman here to close us out. Yeah, I, I would like to maybe talk about the Panchamukhi uh, Hanuman, the five-faced Hanuman. Um, which I think is like a really cool, um, as far as visually, one that's always moved me. That, that's the one that like, I love, you know, anytime I see a picture of Hanuman is like, wow, he's such a, you know, such a cool, um, such a cool expression, you know, and like uh, true devotion and just like us, you know, overcoming our monkey minds, you know, I think is so, such a great way of, uh, you know, like the Rishis were so incredible, you know, um, to be able to express these, these, uh, every single aspect of human development that's still relevant in our lives today were expressed through these amazing pictures and these, like these psychedelic visions, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, Panchamukhi, um, it's an interesting story. Uh, Ravana, you know, the, the king, the demon king who had captured Sita uh, w went to his brother for help in this battle with Ram and uh, his brother's name was Ahar Ravana and he was the king of the underworld of, of uh, Pataloka and you know it's like the netherworld where the, the under the water where you know all the you know, I think it, it probably informed a lot of what people consider the underworld in the West, you know, this, this idea. Um, so when Hanuman became aware that Rama and his brother were captured by, um, by Ravana's brother, uh, he, he went to Pantaloka and he found out that uh, his brother was his life force was sustained in five different candles and uh he had made a boon of course the these demons always always make these boons with the gods which is is a uh, really informative to our practice you know because how do they get these boons it's through uh tapasya which is you know basically like intense worship you know so like when we're practicing meditation and yoga and we're doing sadhana, um, you can gain some, some powers, you know, you can, you, you gain cities, you know, and um, along with that comes, uh, comes ego and comes desire and all those other things. So if you don't have the proper instruction and the proper um, intention and the proper bhavana, as we talked about earlier, um, the these things that you achieve can really go wrong and the demons are like examples of that you know they get greedy and they want these boons and the boon that uh ravana's brother uh ahir ravana um uh had was that he couldn't be killed only if these five uh candles went out at once so hanuman uh became in the form of uh Panchamuki, five-faced Hanuman, and they blew out the candles. Um, and the different ways that they're, you know, each head is one is Hayagriva, one is Narashingwa, one's Garuda, one's uh, Varaha, and one and Hanuman. And each one is a different direction, um, north, south, east, west, and up. And, uh, you know, you get into the five and it's super significant you know there's the five subtle elements the five gross elements um the buddhas and the uh tanmatras um there's the five active instruments of the karmendraya speaking holding moving uh procreating eliminating the five congenitive senses um touching tasting smelling hearing um you know seeing uh mm -hmm. So each the, the the five in the Panchamukhi, the five faced Hanuman, is like it, it's super. Uh, 
it, it's it's really allegorical, really symbolic um, of the five ways of worshiping. We bow, we remember, we recite, we plead, and we offer. Uh, Naman, Smaran, Kirtam, Yachanam, Aparnam are the five, you know, and it, it's the five modes of worship, too. Mm. So that's what's so amazing about these stories. You know, of course, it's it's it, it's a it pulls you in with the drama, you know, of, of the brothers, uh, uh, Ram, Rama and uh, his brother getting captured by these demon kings in the underworld, you know, and then the monkey God, God Hanuman comes and rescues them by blowing out the candles. But the the symbolism that's the core of it, you know, and that's how it reflects in our lives, you know, and that, as we were talking about deities earlier, you know, the, the five ways that we can um, uh, find the humility in our lives to recognize the divine by bowing, by remembering, by reciting, by pleading, by offering, you know, um, the uh, five directions, you know, like that, that's huge, you know, uh, being aware of the five directions and, um you know, that, that means being, uh, 360 degrees attentive in your life. You know, if, if you're paying, you know, if, if you're ignoring one of those directions, anything can come at you and, um, take over. Mm. So, so yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's another amazing aspect of a super amazing Epic, you know, and mm. that's like each little story. That's just like one, like little pebble, in the great stone of the story right you know mm -hmm. and that's like each one each story of hanuman going to drona and bringing the whole mountain back to cure his brother you know like it, it's just so it's it's incredible like each each page is an epic within an epic you know and like the the root that gets of often overlooked i think in the story the in the, the full hanuman tale is that like male and female consciousness the left and the right side of our breath you know um is being separated you know and that's what that happens in um with uh sati when she burns herself you know um when shiva's wife throws herself onto the fire it's what happens when ganesh is blocking shiva from seeing parvati the head comes off you know, it's like all the any time that the male and the female are being uh, blocked or looked at as uh, as opposites and not as one, that's when the problems occur. And that's where ignorance is, you know, and, and it's when we, that's duality, you know, when we're seeing something as left and right, male, female, east, west, you know, good, bad, you know, all those things, those dualities, when the duality is uh the reigning ideal you're always going to have division you know and what the only way to create unity is to unite the left and the right all those things and make one mm -hmm. i love that thank you thank you for sharing that story it 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 gives us such a good glimpse of the possibilities of reading these stories and spending time with these sacred images and what it can really do for us. It was reminding me as you were talking about, you know, when I was young and I was getting into this the esoteric artwork and this strange uh, extremes and, and into music and all the things that I was searching for, you, you know, even into like, I got into Lucha Libre really hard, or I got into like different things where yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, <laughs> just like searching for the, the, the secrets of the universe feel like they're locked up within these things. And then I would, I would get into them really hard and then find sort of, I would dig to the bottom and it would be like, okay, that's the bottom. And then, but when I, when I found the Ramayana and the Bhagavad Gita, it was like, there's no bottom. And every little tiny fractal of the story can fractal off into all of these this meaning for you and you can just never find an end and, and you can never get made to feel silly for diving in deeper and deeper and deeper you know like I nah. felt like when I would get into movies or a book or music it would feel like you know if you get too far into it it's like nah you're just making shit up now that's not really what it's about with this right it's whatever you say it's about is what it's about and it just it can work on you personally because it's yeah. it's based in consciousness and consciousness is immeasurable and beyond limit you know so um when with uh 
with the explanation of the consciousness, um, it, it gives you like the basis for, for just about for everything, for everything in life, you know, everything applies to the Gita, everything applies to the Ramaya, everything applies to the Bhagavatam. And, uh, it, it's amazing. Um, it's funny that you mentioned, uh, uh, Lucha Libre, you know, cause, uh, I always thought that too, like even like professional wrestling, you know, like those, they were the gods when I was a mm-hmm. kid, those guys were the gods and the narratives were, were, uh, were amazing, you know, and like, uh, and it was built into the carnival thing, which is where tattooing kind of le- in, in the West was born. And, uh, and like, uh, the circus and clowns and all these things, these are all sacred, ancient modalities, you know, like the circus is an ancient modality, um, to, for expression, you know, so is the theater. So is music. So is, you know, film now, and you know, all these other things, you know, like it exists, all these amazing, beautiful ideals and stories and, um, fables and mysteries and myths exist in all things and that's what makes them relevant you know if they weren't they'd just be like you know pop culture you know gone with the next thing Mm -hmm. yeah they come and go and yeah if they're not if they're they don't have that power and then with these stories they just they don't even know how old they are they could be they could be just weaved into the fabric of our existence yeah they were they've been written for like what three or four thousand years but Mm -hmm. you know who knows orally how long they've been passed down I, they've been passed down for as long as there's people have been communicating mm, so wonderful well thank you so much robert it's been a super pleasure talking to you and i know like it's got me excited to dive into like, exploring the deities today and drawing and making artwork around them so i hope it's uh, inspired a lot of others to want to start looking into these more and more because it, it, it just the more energy you put in the more you get back it just it loves you back when you love it so i think um you, everything that you've said today i think has spark a lot of uh, a lot of curiosity in people so thank you for your time oh thank you so much thanks for the opportunity and um it's been great talking with you and i hope we can do it again as soon as uh, as soon as it works out great thank you so much robert and, all right thank and you let everybody know where they can find you because you should go i mean robert's got uh, a lot of other interviews podcasts view on duncan trussell he's got a great one on uh, vice tattoo age is an awesome tattoo series so i think your instagram is probably the best way to find you yeah if you go to my instagram I- if and go to the link in the profile i, I have everything linked there now so you can mm-hmm. you can uh, all the podcasts this, this one when it's ready will be up there too and then um you know I, i've been trying to kind of keep that stuff uh uh organized more organized now it's so a good link tree stuff. yeah it's yeah, a good thanks. link tree so go to that link tree and then you can find his music as well i would definitely yeah. download those two songs i've been listening to those regularly so oh awesome yeah. and the records <laughs> the record will be out um hopefully god willing uh in october um and oh that's one thing i'd like to talk about cuz i'm sure this will uh will air before it happens but anybody who's in the east coast who's interested um an amazing an amazing um beautiful singer is coming to our area from uh bengal uh her name is parvati ball das she's a ball singer anyone who's not familiar with the ball style of singing is it's this a uh, beautiful folk singing um that was uh started in bengal and it's this tradition of these wandering musicians who are like these uh, sadhus basically who were um, just giving their lives to the song. Mm. And uh, she's going to be here in Asbury with us in October. She's going to be doing something at the temple. And then uh, we're going to play a show together. Um, Soma and and her at a church in Mm. in the church, which I'm really excited about because it's a beautiful uh, Trinity Baptist church in Asbury park. And then, uh, we're having an art show because she's also an amazing visual artist. Mm. So also I, I'll, I'll talk to you after this is over, but um, I would, I know she's interested in re- reaching people uh, on, on different platforms. So maybe you can uh, catch an interview with her. I can yeah, put you in touch with her. Yeah. yeah uh, we like were that. talking about maybe doing like a panel discussion at the art show. So maybe we can kind of work something out. 
Mm, that, beautiful. I think this would be great. But yeah, so yeah, we're going to be doing three days and uh, it's just like having a woman, uh, a person with such saintly qualities coming here is, is a Special huge blessing. So. Opportunity. Yeah, yeah, great. All right. I'm looking forward to learning about that. I'll see if I can make it out there if I can break away. That'd be great. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Robert. Till Thank next you, time. man. Blessings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Blessings. <laughs> Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya.